Sate is like, guys, how do I describe sate? It's like a, it's like a skewer, like a beef skewer, or like sometimes there's chicken, sometimes there's pork. Anyways, so my mom, I think there's a picture I put up. I, I got some visuals for y'all today. My mom every year makes this bus delicious sate, and like even though most people really liked it, and most people were like, you know, it would be something that she would make because my birthday's in the summer. My brother and my mom's birthday is in the summer. So it would be a big, like, birthday thing. It would be a big, like, you know, annual thing that she would make when it was summertime. Do you have a picture? Oh, there's a picture, but maybe there's not. Um, oh, there it is. <laughs> That's my mom. Um, are we eating satay? That picture is from, so it would be, like, for events, but we would also bring it, like, whenever we had, like, parties or this was, like, a, one of the, the captains, we had, like, leadership fellowship. We went on a retreat. And we brought sate a couple years ago back. It was really good. But even though, like, it was some people's, like, favorite part of the meal or et cetera, et cetera, it was actually my least favorite thing that she makes. And there's a reason. No, no, no. I'm not having. There's a reason, okay? Y'all get to just eat it and experience it. But I was, but, like, behind the scenes, and I was always on fan duty. You guys know what I'm talking about? So, like, when the grill is going, yeah, dead is, like, nodding her head. Like, you know, if your mom's a cook, you know, you know. Or if your dad, like, does the grill. So she's, like, she's, like, always on the grill. And I'm, like, waking up super early. Like, my eyes barely open. I got charcoal, like, already in my eyes going, like, the smoke. You, my whole house, like, all floors just, mmm. <laughs> like, it just smells. And I'm on fan duty. And I'm sitting there, like, bro, can this be over already? Like, I really don't care who, like, ordered this. I just don't, I don't want to do this. It's, like, hot. I'm dripping sweat. But one thing that I didn't realize, and I, even though I realize I'm still, like, I don't want to do it, is, like, without fanning that flame, the fire to cook the sate would die out. And not only would it die out, maybe there wouldn't be enough fire to sustain to cook a good enough sate. And I thought to myself, like, oh, that's so good. Like, I mean, not good for me because I had to, like, fan, fan the whole time. But I was thinking of that illustration and wanting to talk about our lives and what that looks like for us and how we fan our flame with the fire of God. How are you fanning your flame? So we're going to jump right in, okay? The title of my message today is Fanning the Flame. Can everyone say that together? One, two, three. Fanning the Flame. All right. And there is, like, a little fun fact, little nerdy science fact about fire and flames it, um, that I just Googled, honestly. Oxygen is an essential component of fire, right? The more oxygen that's applied or, like, you know, brought to the fire, the hotter the flame and the more it will burn. So that's also why, you know, my mom was telling me to, like, sit there and fit. I'm like, I'm like, can we be done? But we're going to talk about fanning our spiritual flame, fanning the flame of the fire of God that's within us. Amen? Are you guys ready? So I thought of like, I thought this might be like a little bit hard to understand. And there's, I'm not going to lie, there's a lot today. So I hope that you guys are following along with me because we're going to like, we're going to try to speed through this. So three things that we need to understand about fanning the flame of God. The first thing that we need to understand is that God is a consuming fire. Can we say that together? One, two, three. And I know that's a little bit confusing. It was confusing for me too. But I'm going to give you three examples. I mean, there's, there's way more than three. Like if you've read your Bible, whether you're in the Old Testament or you're in the New Testament, there's way more than three. But I'm going to talk about three examples of how God is revealed through fire in the Bible. The first one, God is seen as an all-powerful consuming fire. And we're going to open up Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 23 to 24. All right, let's read this all together. Ready? One, two, three. So be careful. Oh, no. There's like 60 of y'all in here. But, like, I only hear Chris. Come on. We're going to read this all together. One, two, three. So be careful. Amen. And then we're going to focus on that verse 24. The Lord your God is a devouring fire. He is a jealous God. Initial thoughts after reading that is like, oh, that's like kind of scary, right? Like, 
this is Moses talking in the Old Testament. He's telling the Israelites that he's not going with them to the promised land. If you guys like have read the Old Testament, you know that even though Moses brought the Israelites through the Red Sea, he didn't end up going with them to the promised land because of his own human sin, of his own disobedience to God. But Moses is warning them. He's telling them, don't forget the covenant. Don't forget the promise of God. He's saying when he refers to God as a consuming fire, he's reiterating just like how powerful God is. He's saying like God is a jealous God. And it's not like it's not like our jealousy, like our human jealousy, which is usually petty, right? Let's be honest. It's not that kind of jealousy. It's the kind of zealous, jealous God where he wants us to himself. He doesn't want us going to other idols. He doesn't want us being half and half with him. He wants our full heart. He wants our full devotion. Amen? So God is saying here that he's all powerful. It also says in Hebrews, I don't have this verse up, but it says like, it also mentions God as a de devouring fire. He is an all-consuming God who consumes the fire of our judgment and of our sins through and our guilt, right, through Jesus. And he consumed that fire. He took that away because he's all-powerful. So that's the first way. The first example, right? The second example, God is seen as fire in his holiness. Everyone say holiness. I'm going kind of fast here, but these are just three examples of how I want you to understand that God is shown in the Bible as fire, right? And these three are all important. There's others too. We're going to open up to Leviticus. If you need notes, I'll send you this after too, so don't you worry. Um, I find that like when we were at Extend, um, we were at one of our breakout sessions, and I'm typically like a note taker too, but I'll be like, my head will be in the notebook the whole time and how many of you guys know that sometimes it's good to take notes and there's definitely blessings on that but sometimes how many of you know that God just wants you to take it in he wants you to listen he wants you to be like full attention right so if you need notes I got you later we're gonna open up to Leviticus chapter 6 verses 8 through 9 and then jump to 12 to 13 again this is Moses talking to Aaron but in a, a bit of a different context all right Let's read this together. One, two, three. Then the Lord said to Moses, give Aaron and his sons the following instructions regarding the burnt offering. The burnt offering must be left on top of the altar until morning. And the fire on the altar must be kept burning all night. All right. Meanwhile, the fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must never go out. At all times. It must never go out. Amen. So you might be thinking, like, why is there so many, like, there's so, it's so tedious. Like, why do I need to understand so much about this fire, when it doesn't go out, the altar, all these things. How many of you know that Moses is talking to Aaron and all the other Israelite priests, and he's saying there are specific instructions and specific ways to handle the fire. Specific ways to handle the fire of God, especially in the Old Testament. Like these offerings that they were giving, these burnt offerings were for sin offering. So like whenever you committed literally any sin, like think of something that you probably did this morning, like you lied to your mom or something, or like you like you you saw the clock and you were about to wake up for 8 a.m., but then you didn't and you flipped it over. Like I've done that so many times. You know, any kind of sin would require a burnt offering. That's how holy our God is. Amen. That's how holy it is. That's how much we need to be careful and we need to really think about the fire of God. They had specific instructions. It wasn't just about the type of animal, how they handled, but also about how they handled the flame of God. Because God is so holy and he was so holy, they only could prepare it a certain way. Only a certain amount of people, only a very specific people could come to the altar. And so when you're thinking about like all of you guys right here right now, probably none of us would be qualified to go to that altar, to go and to give an offering God. It's not like how we can do now. Like, you know, we can just sing a song like anytime, any day, whether there's a full band, whether it's in like Judah's sunroom, whether it's in the car, whether you're listening at a concert, like literally anywhere, that's your altar. You're bringing that to God as your offering. But that's not the case of how it was before. Why? Because God was so holy. And this is before Jesus, right? 
He was so holy, he needed a holy sacrifice. But the fire and how they handled the fire was just as important. And the last way, the third way that God is seen as a fire, God is seen as fire through the Holy Spirit. Everyone say, Holy Spirit. I know it's a term that we've heard all the time, but it's something that, honestly, sometimes you forget that it's there, right? We forget that God's spirit hasn't just come onto us one time, but it dwells in us. Everyone say dwell. It dwells. It stays in us. Let's open up to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. In the book of Acts, the apostles, the disciples, they were waiting on this. He died and resurrected. They were waiting on Jesus in the upper room. They were waiting on this promise and to, to know God. Let's read this together. Hey, okay, ready? One, two, three. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking. Amen. So it says here that he poured out his fire onto them. The fire is the Holy Spirit. Everyone say fire is the Holy Spirit. And if you already believe in Jesus and you've received the Holy Spirit, guess what? You have that fire in you right now. You have that fire in you when you wake up and you're not feeling like going to school. You're not feeling like going to work. You have that fire in you when you're having that tough conversation with maybe a non-believer and you don't know how to face it. That fire that we have is in us. The same fire of God himself, he, he gives us his fire through the Holy Spirit and it dwells in us. But are we fanning that flame? Is it dim in us? So that's, those are the three ways that I wanted to example and show God as fire. The second thing that we need to understand about fanning our flame, the second thing is that fire burns from within our hearts. Can we say that together? One, two, three. And this might, this might seem like, I don't know if this is confusing or not, but let's open up to Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. And there's like some context behind this. Like during, I'll give some context before we read. So during this time, Jeremiah, he was a prophet. And he was going through, like the context itself isn't really, I mean, it's like the bigger picture, right? But specifically with Jeremiah, what he was going through at the time, he had to bear a painful price to remain faithful to God as his messenger. Basically, like, he was going, being persecuted, and he was so ready to give up on God. He was so ready to give up on the message that he was preaching to the people. Because maybe they weren't believing. They were, like, rebelling. They're, like, you're full of, I don't know what that is. Like, I don't want to believe in that. I don't want to receive that. And Jeremiah was at the breaking point. He was like, he was like, God, it's so hard. What will I do? He contemplated giving up so many times. And let's, we're going to read this verse together. One, okay. One, two, three. But if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak in his name, his words burn like fire in my bones. I'm worn out trying to hold it in and I can't do it. Amen. So this is basically Jeremiah speaking. And he's, it's kind of like hypothetical, right? He's saying if I were to stop spreading the message, telling the people of the truth, I can't. Like, I simply can't. Why? Because his words burn in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in his bones. And I'm worn out and I'm trying to hold it in. And then in verse 11, it says, but the Lord stands beside me like a great warrior. So Jeremiah, is just the first he's talking to God and he's like, I am at the breaking point. And I don't know what to do, but my, I literally can't keep it in. Have you ever felt that way? Like, when you're maybe in a place where people around you are just not looking like, they're not acting like how maybe they should be, or maybe they call themselves Christians, but they're not showing that. And you want to just keep quiet, and maybe you want to just follow the crowd. But something in your heart is like, I shouldn't do that. Or like, ooh, I shouldn't go there. Or ooh, I shouldn't say the same words that those people are saying. Something in your heart burns like a fire. And that's what I'm trying to say, Okay. Our fire is so easily to be publicly seen. Like, if you see people coming to church every week, maybe they're serving every week, their fire could be really dim. 
It could be really small. And then maybe there's that one person that comes to church and sits in the corner by themselves and they're struggling, but their fire for God is so hungry and they're desperate for God. What I'm trying to say is you can't judge someone's fire only on how it appears on the outside. God judges our fire and looks at our fire from our hearts from within. Amen? Let's see. Um, just like in Leviticus, right, the lighting of the fire and the flame. All the work that had to be done to keep that fire on all night. Can you imagine, like, you know how long, hard it is? Like, I know from experience, okay, from Sate, how hard it is to keep the fan of the fire flaming, even for one, two hours. Can you imagine all through the night, all the work that it took getting the wood, drying the wood, making the preparations ready, things that you don't see on the outside, things that people weren't seeing, you know, when they came, when the altar, when the burnt offering was given, they just saw, oh, the offering is still there. Oh, the fire is still there. Can you imagine like going to sleep and the fire is there and you wake up and it's still there? You thought that it just stayed there all night. No, there had to be work that had to be done in the middle. And I think one thing that's so important is that sometimes we just need to reflect on the fire of our hearts. Amen. How is it burning? Like, like I am... You know, I mentioned before, like, sometimes I like to journal, and but I'm being honest, like, sometimes my journal gets a little dusty. Like, I don't pick it up for, like, a week maybe, maybe two weeks, or maybe a couple of days. And whenever I do, like, I start writing, and then sometimes, like, my hand will get tired. Like, my hand will get tired. But then you keep writing, and then something in your heart just burns, and you want to pray, and you want to speak, and you want to pray for others, and things just keep coming up. There's a fire, that, and what happens in the places and the times that people don't see is truly what matters the most. So how are we reflecting on the fire of our hearts? And let's open up to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, really quick. This is just a reminder for all of us. It's not just about the fire, but everything in our life. Let's read this together. Ready? One, two, three. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Amen. Let's read it again and really like sink it in into your minds. Ready? One, two, three. Guard your heart above all else. Now look to someone. Don't read it. You should have read it. You read it twice. You should have remembered it already. But if you need to take a peek, I won't judge. Tell someone next to you this verse. We're going to read it to each other. Ready? One, two, three. Guard your heart above all else for it determines the course. Amen. So guard your heart, okay? Guard your hearts. Okay, glaze. All right, the last thing, the third thing I want to talk about, what we need to understand about our fire. The third thing is that your flame is contagious. Everyone say contagious. contagious. A few weeks ago, Gil talked about being a light, right? He talked about that book in Matthew, that we are a light a city on a hilltop, right? Our light needs to be bright and it needs to shine. Your fire is contagious. Whether you like it or not, whether you realize it or not, the way you live your life, the way you take care of your fire is going to be contagious. It's going to transfer to others. If you're hanging around people that their fire is like really dim, like it's on the, voy- it's on the verge of, like, of just like going out, whether you realize it or not, the more you hang out with them and the more you just have that company, your fire and your flame will start to go down too. And you won't realize it. But if you're hanging out with people who are on fire for God, they're like, come on, come to AGL, go to Bible study, do all these things. Your fire, even if it's not based on your own works, it will start to increase and start to increase. And when we were at at Extend, um, one of the speakers, I forget his name, but one of the speakers, he was saying something, and it was so good, guys. And it really touched me, too. People were asking him, uh, he was like an evangelist, like a speaker, and like all these things. And someone asked him, like, hey, what is it that keeps you, kind of keeps you going? Like, what is it that keeps you on fire for God and your mission and keeps you serving him, regardless of, like, the world and social media and what people say? And what he said really touched me. He was saying that it's really that he has such a burden on his heart for God's people, for people to be saved. And when I first heard that, I was like, okay, burden. Like when you think of burden, you think of something that you dread, right? Something that's heavy, something that's a weight on you. But for him, the fire that kept lighting in his heart, what kept pushing him through the physical challenges, the maybe circumstance challenges, 
was the fire and the burden for others to know Jesus. And that fire is contagious. When you come up here and like if someone comes up here and they're like, hey guys, like welcome to AGC. Y'all going to be sleeping in like five minutes. But if someone comes in like, hey guys, like we're going to like, blah, blah, like, you know, they're just like really energetic. Y'all going to be paying attention, right? And so the fire and your flame is contagious. Even in the smallest conversations you have, it's contagious. Even in the one-on-ones that you have when you're telling someone or someone's telling you about maybe a struggle they're going through, the way you carry your flame is contagious to them and it's going to transfer them because the Holy Spirit lives in us and it gives us that power. It allows us to do that. So let's read Matthew chapter 5, verse 15 through 16. It's the verse, same verse as a couple weeks ago. All right. Let's read this. One, two, three. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Amen. So again, reiterating this, like fire, it obviously, like I'm sure most, like I don't have to explain this, like, but it brings light. So wherever you go, you carry that flame with you. It will light the way, it will light the path, whether it's for you, whether it's for someone else. That fire that we carry is contagious. 